ladies and gentlemen, I want to bring our um, fiscal year 2020-2021 uh, budget work session and special meeting to order. Um, first on our, our agenda, which um, we're going to be uh, addressing the addendum to the emergency declaration, which is we're going to send the Warren County curfew that was established. And um, before we do that, uh, we want to ensure that the public knows and understands that, um, thank you, <clears throat> that the governor's uh, stay, um, stay at home order is still in active, phase one is still in order, which is um, what we are calling wait, wear, and wash. Is that right? Is that right? Okay. And, um, Wait and not being the only one uh, in more than uh, six feet and wear a mask and, and wash your hands when you're out in public. But just remember that the, the uh, first stage, stage one of the governor's uh, declaration is still in order. We're just rescinding Warren County's curfew, which was from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, before. I ask for a motion to rescind our, ask the commissioners if they have any comments or questions or concerns in reference to saying. All right, hearing none, I would entertain a motion that we rescind our curfew for Warren County as stated. Mr. Chair, I move that we rescind the Warren County curfew as stated. And properly motion by Commissioner Hunt, second by Commissioner Pierce, that we rescind our uh, Warren County curfew. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Uh, I will go back and do a little housekeeping. I do apologize, but um, for our social media uh, citizens that are watching, this uh, Commissioner Bernadine Baker is on the phone, and I believe Mr. Powell is on there now, is he not? M Mr. Powell, are you there? Well, maybe he'll be joining us um, pretty soon. You, you take care of that, Paul. Thank you so much. All right, uh, the second order of business is for us to accept the coronavirus relief funds. And Mr. Jones, you wanna say a little bit about that before? Sure, sure, thank you, Commissioner. I also will have um, our finance director, Ms. Baffert, come forward. But as you know, the federal government has uh, passed a few coronavirus uh, relief acts, and those acts are actually providing some funding to the state, and the state in turn has provided some of that funding to local governments. And we have two instances tonight uh, where we have been able to receive some of those funds. So just to make sure we are in compliance with our grant policy, we are asking for your approval to accept over $500,000 in funds from the state. And then EMS specifically has received some funds for the expenses that they are incurring. And uh, Ms. Baffert will provide you the detail when she brings those items forward. All right, thank you, Mr. Jones. Ms. Baffert? You can do it right there if you want, that's okay. okay. Um, if you bring the details on the pathogenic. Okay. Um, the microphone might, uh, the microphone, inside. yeah. Try to get you ready, Ms. Brett. No, that's right, keep trying. I appreciate it. All right. <laughs> okay, um, I have the, the background on the budget amendment to, uh, to budget the 45,000 $551 um, that was awarded or given to the emergency medical services um, to use to, sub to pay for uh, COVID-19 expenditures. And this came, uh, it was a supplemental Medicare payment and from the U.S. Health and Human Services Stimulus Fund. And again, they uh, there are restrictions on it has to be used to uh, for expenditures related to uh, the coronavirus or COVID-19. All right, Mr. Jones. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. So, Ms. Bradford, if you could talk about, I mean, that is a budget amendment, uh -huh. and that's fine, and then I can provide an overview of the um, $500,000 because they have a memo related to that, and I forgot I was the one who put that memo. Okay. Was there, were there any questions about the budget? I'm sorry? Is there a date that that money has to be unified? Like, is it through December 31st, or is it just? Uh, Mr. Chief Pascal and I are going to get together in the morning because we've got to go in and officially accept the funds and fill out some paperwork, and uh, and that will I, I'll be able to tell you that next time. Thank you, Ms. Bradford. You got something to add? So, 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 Ms. Bradford is uh, doing a budget amendment. For us, we want to stay in compliance with our grant policy, and again, these are coronavirus relief funds that we are scheduled to receive from the state in five, an, an amount of $571,000 and $30. Um, $30. And uh, there is, we have to go in, let's, just like Ms. Bradford said, there is a little bit of an application that we have to do just to say that we would like to receive the money. The state will send it to us electronically um, within a few days of us submitting that application. But we have to come back to you with a plan that we have to submit to the state by June 1st. And these funds do have to be used by December 30th of this year. Okay. All right, is there any other discussion or questions in reference to the uh, acceptance of the coronavirus release fund? Yep, I understand a motion. Chair, I move that we accept the coronavirus release fund. Mr. President Baker. Second. It's been properly motioned by Commissioner Baker. Second by Commissioner Hunt that we accept the coronavirus uh, relief funds as stated. Is there any further discussion? I've got a quick question. So, yes, are these funds to be used for like, um, like EMS is using for transport and like for insurance or something like that? Sure. And so th those examples that you gave are all good examples. And so um, there are categories of funds, but they all have to be related to expenses that we have incurred or expect to incur um, related to the pandemic. So yes, PPE absolutely can be used. We can even go so far as to um, pay for technology. For example, we have a need to have laptops for our directors to make sure if we're ever in a position again, that we can work remotely without any problems. So all of those sorts of things are acceptable expenses. We just have to outline what we would like to um, pay for in our plan. And um, you know, if the state says that there are expenses that we have incurred that don't fall in line with uh, uh, what you would expect to be an expense from the, the um, pandemic, then we would have to pay for that. But the categories are broad enough that, that there aren't any problems with us paying for. Um, for example, we had to get a detailed um, cleaning of two of our buildings, for example. It was very expensive. And we can use those funds to, to pay for that cleaning because it was related to those funds. Are you okay, Ms. Spears? I'm good, thank you. All right, thank you. I understand that Mr. Powell is on the, on the line there. Mr. Powell, just to catch you up, that we're entertaining a motion, which the motion is on the floor by Ms. Baker and second by Commissioner Hunt, that we accept the coronavirus relief funds. We, we just finished up discussion in reference to saying, do you have any uh, discussion, questions, or statements? No, I don't. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. aye. All right, motion is carried. Let's take a moment to do a little some more housekeeping. Um, how are we doing with social media? Are we talking loud enough? Or? I think if you can just make sure you are speaking directly into a microphone like this, that would be awesome. Okay. All yeah. Right. Right. Otherwise, you're, you're good. good. You've heard your request, and Mr. Jones? And the second part of that would be that That's budget great. amendment that Ms. Uh, Baffert mentioned to you. Hers is actually a budget amendment. For EMS? Yes. Yes, Ms. Baker. Excuse me, I just text Paula to ask you all to speak louder because I can hear you very well, but the others are not coming in clearly. Okay. You know what you you last your mics, please. Okay. <laughs> Can you see this? 
Can you hear me, Miss Baker? I can It's actually a budget amendment that you would make. Okay, yes. okay, this is the memorandum that you passed out to us in the second. Okay. And that is at four um four to five thousand five one five five one. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, the request is that we accept the Actually, it's a budget amendment number 15 to the fiscal year 2020 budget ordinance and is being presented for approval. And this is for the emergency medical services budget at uh, 45,551. That is the um, request, and I entertain a motion or a discussion in reference to sign. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve budget amendment number 15 to the FY 2020 budget ordinance. All right, it's been properly motioned by Commissioner Pierce, second by Commissioner Baker, that we approve the fiscal, excuse me, the budget amendment number 15 as stated and requested. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay? Aye. All right, motion is carried. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to go into um, fiscal year 21 budget overview and discussion, but before then, we're going to entertain item 3B which is the Warren County classification and pay study presentation. Mr. Jones. Sure, thank you, Chairman. This evening we have uh, Mr. David Hill. He's from the P Piedmont Triad Regional Council, which is their um, council of governments compared to our card, card, card. And Mr. Hill is part of the team that uh, conducted our Warren County classification and pay study. It's referenced in the proposed budget for you and we expected to have this presentation for you all last month, but we had to put that on hold. So he's here this evening to present to you the classification and page study report. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this works. Yeah. I have David Hill. Uh, Bob Carter assisted me on your study. He and I both are about seven year retired local government employees. And since I've retired, we've been working with the Piedmont Triad Regional Council of Governments located up in the Winston-Salem area. But we do work all across the state. We truly have worked from Murphy to Manio, and actually to Nags Head, even further across the bridge. But this evening I want to talk to you about the pay plan and position classification study that we conducted for Warren County. And in my presentation, I'm going to talk about the, from the initial meetings we had with employees beginning in this room, uh, the collection of market data, the analysis of that data, follow-up meetings, initial meetings and follow-up meetings with county manager and uh, HR manager. And working through all of that data until we came up with a, a reasonable recommendation for the county. So I may need Paula's assistance, but I think we can okay now. So what I'll begin with, and most of this data is in the report that I think you have with uh, part of your package. What I have on the PowerPoint is some additional data that may or may not be in your report. The report actually contains more detailed information. The data that's in the PowerPoint is for the purposes of giving that overview. So as I go through, we're going to be, first we're going to talk about what the county looked like at the very beginning of the study. That allows us to collect data at the very beginning of the study and I'm talking about 
January, the middle of January this, of this year, is the beginning of the study, for us to take a, a, a glimpse, a, a photo, a snapshot of what you look like as far as your workforce. That allowed us to create or establish some benchmarks. So most of what I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides, I want you to view those with the standard deviation or bell curve. Just keep that as the, as the primary focus as you look at the graphs and charts that come hereafter. Because I, I will talk about and use this when I talk about salary grades, ranges, the position of employees, salaries in relation to their grades. But in a mature workforce, and our definition of a mature workforce is anybody, any local government who has a average length of employment of between eight and 10 years. And if you look only at that element, Warren County has a mature workforce. You have an average length of employment of a little over nine years. So as we look at this bar graph, over there, of course, would be people who just began work. Here you would have people who have been with you in that eight to 10 year period, and then people who have been with you much longer than that. So again, as this is the back, uh, with this as the backdrop, we're gonna take a look at some other charts. And again, the very first thing we take a look at is, what does that distribution of employees look like in accordance with their employment date? Now, I told you that you have a mature workforce, but a lot of that is because you have a considerable number of employees who've been with you a very long time. But if you take a look at this chart, and I do have an inability to recreate a bell curve. So my bell curves look more like a St. Louis arch. <laughs> But if you'll look at that arch, and that arch represents a 25-year career, you, you have employees who have been with you um, close to 40 years. But you can see that the majority of your employees have only come to work for you in the last few years. Actually, you have a quarter of your employees have been with you two years or less. You have 42% of your employees have been with you for five years or less. And then you have 65% of your employees have been with you 10 years or less. Now, in a lot of my reporting, I talk about in terms of two, five, and 10 years or less. A lot of times in my reporting, I also talk about less than two, less than five, less than 10. So my numbers here may not match up exactly with the numbers in the report because I use different measuring points. But this is just that graphic to show you that you do have quite a few employees who've been with you for a long time, but you have the majority of the employees have been with you a relatively short period of time. Now what this chart does not show you is the number of employees who came to work for you in each of these years. All this is is telling us who are those employees still employed who came to work in each of those years. So is 2013 the standard and I'm just making this up? Did you hire about that many people each year? If you did, where did they go? Why are they no longer working? Those are some of the kinds of things that we talk about. A point here, just in this graph, this represents the first quarter of this year, actually through March 23rd. Through March 23rd, you've already employed 17 employees. If you continue the calendar year at that rate, you will end up employing 68 new employees and that, go, and that bar graph would be somewhere right there. Now, I don't know that you'll continue at that rate, but 
that as of March 23rd, you've employed 17 new employees. This is a similar chart, but this measures how long have employees been in their current position. And, what, and this becomes important to us later as we focus a lot on this. The first chart tells us how long employees have been with you. This chart tells us how long they've been in their current position. A deputy could have come to work 10 years ago, been promoted, promoted to corporal, been promoted to sergeant. So we look at how long they've been in their current position. And again, you can see that you've got a third of your employees have been in their position less than two years, over half less than five, greater than 75%, less than 10. Do I need to do something differently here with this microphone? We'll, we'll check. We're checking it out. All right, this is a measurement of employees' salaries in relation to their pay grade range. Now, every one of your employees is in a series of pay grades. Sheriff's deputy is in a certain pay grade, a sergeant's in a certain pay grade. Every position has an assigned pay grade. What this chart shows us is where are individual employee salaries in relation to their grade range minimum. So every grade range has a minimum salary. Currently, your range is 60%, which means that this point right here is 60% greater than the minimum back to that bell curve, back to that center portion of that bell curve. <coughs> right there would be 30% above minimum, which would be the midpoint. There is where we would expect to find salaries of employees who have been in their position 10 or more years. You can see that there are not a lot of salaries in this location of that bell curve. So what this does, and then the next one is almost the same. This measures salaries in relation to the minimum. <laughs> this one measures employee salaries in relation to the midpoint of their range. And that part is important because it's that midpoint of a range that is actual the market value of the position. The market value of the position is not the entry level salary. There's where you would bring employees to work who, who just meet the minimum qualifications. The midpoint of a range is the average salary of an employee who's been in that position eight to 10 years knows the position, is performing the, the, the task of the position uh, efficiently, this is where you would expect to find those employees. This is one of the charts that we take a look at when we're trying to determine if you have what's known as salary compression. Do you have employees who've been with you a relatively long period of time? Back to that first chart but who have salaries that are the same as, or nearly the same as, new employees that you bring to work. You can see by this chart, and this is without regard to how long they've been working here. This is just the actual measurement of where your employee salaries are in relation to that point right there. And if I have a salary that is 5% above minimum, I would be about right here. 10% above minimum would be about right here. With all of that said, you've got almost half of your employees who have salaries very near, only 5% above the minimum. You have over 70% of your employees who have salaries 
that are less than 10% above the minimum. This is what salary compression looks like. This is what salary of new employees, long-term employees, people who have been with you different lengths of period of time that you in this grouping right here. You have employees who have been with you a very long time. In this grouping right here, you have employees who have been with you a relatively short period of time. These spikes right here uh, are there because those show salary increases based on your current longevity program. So you do have a longevity program that employees would come to work at or near the minimum, and then after a specified period of employment, they would get a salary adjustment. So there's where those spikes come in, that there is very little opportunity for employee salary advancement beyond that point. Now, you know, one of the other things we take a look at at the beginning of the study, we typically take a look at the last 10%. The last 10% of employees who came to work. In your case, that's about 30 employees. Where did those employees, what positions did they go into, what departments did they go into? And you're not unlike any other government. Any other county government in North Carolina, the three largest departments are health, DSS, and SHIP. So you're, you're the same as any other county. When we take a look at where did the last 10% of employees go to work, health, DSS, and SHIP. But for you, you can see that health and DSS are over here. Sheriff is way over here. Now, I addressed this in the report. But I'm, I'm, in my report comments, I'm only making some assumptions. Because this is very untypical. In just about every other county government that we work in, this sheriff's bar is right over here next to health and DSS. Because again, those are the three largest departments. They typically are going to have the greatest opportunity to hire new employees. So here my assumption is the sheriff doesn't have any turnover. The sheriff has no opportunity to employ anybody. That's why they're here. Flip side of the coin is the sheriff has plenty of opportunities, just like every other sheriff's office has, but has the inability to bring employees to work. My assumption is the sheriff has as many opportunities for employment as any other sheriff's office and just does not have the opportunity to bring people to work. This is the very same 10% of employees, but what position did they come to work in? Now, even though health and DSS are the largest departments by employee, they don't readily show up down here. Detention officer is number one. Buildings and grounds maintenance worker, income maintenance case worker, paramedic, and so forth. So you can see that by department, these typically are gonna show up based on the department size, the opportunity. These down here, and these are just an accumulation of one position at a time. These are two, and that's three. One of the other things we take a look at as part of this snapshot. What is your average salary compared to everybody else that we took a look at? This is Warren County right here. This is the average. The average of all of those other local governments is 40,554. Warren County's average salary is 36,353. What we measure there is the actual salaries of regular full-time employees. We don't count part-time or temporary or any other status. We only count regular full-time employees. So based on how, how do you look, what is the measurement of where you are compared to these other local governments? And you can see that relative position of where you are compared to everybody else.
So here is that 36353 average salary that I talked about. This is a distribution of all of your employees' annual salaries in $5,000 increments. Of course, your average salary is 36, so that would be about right over here somewhere. The majority of your employees have salaries in the 25, but less than $30,000 range. That's the highest bar right here. Those are employees who are earning 25,000, but less than 30. And then right next to those are employees who are earning 30,000, but less than 35. So that's your average, but you can see where that accumulation of salaries is located. Sorry, Paula. What I've done here is I, I took all of those classifications of all of those employees who earn 25,000 but less than 30,000. I, I won't spend a whole lot of time going over this. This is broken down by department and the, and the classification and the number of employees in that classification. This and the next slide, and you will have a copy of this slide to, to look at later, but this and the next slide identified those particular classifications and the number of employees in those classifications, income maintenance uh, caseworker. DSS has 11 of those. And this is just a continuation. Registered deeds has a classification of deputy registered deeds. There are three employees in that. Those three employees have that salary of at least 25 or less than 30,000. So based on all of that initial data, analysis, comparison, the two primary concerns that we came up with was your salaries were not market competitive and you had a significant degree of salary compression. So what we'll take a look at now is that actual study. I won't spend a whole lot of time going over this. This is just that methodology. We started in this room with employee meetings. Uh, we met with the manager, talked about where we were, where we were going, how we were gonna get there. Employees completed a 12-page position description questionnaire. That was a questionnaire designed that each employee completed telling us every detail about their position what they did, how they did, and what they did it with, every, every element of what they did. We collected and reviewed all that market data. We made initial findings and recommendations based on that data that we collected and all that information. We then came back and had a meeting with Mr. Jones and, uh, and Kia, and we went over those initial findings and recommendations. We worked through that. We took into consideration a lot of other information about Warren County because here you had two guys from the outside looking at a bunch of data and coming and sitting down with the manager and saying, based on all the data, based on all the information that we have, here's where, here's the salary grades that we believe all of your positions should be in based on market comparisons. And here's the individual salaries that we believe each of your employees should have based on those same comparisons. Now I can tell you that we had that initial meeting with Mr. Jones. We told him that because of that data, because of our interpretation of that data, and based on our initial recommendations, the cost of implementing those original recommendations would be a little more than $2 million. So when I said that to Mr. Jones, he looked at me and said, you have some other options. <laughs> Absolutely. And we did. We worked through a series of options, took, took a look at all the numbers, how differently could we look at all those numbers, what differently could we do with all of those numbers. So to begin with, here's, all, here's those local governments that we collected data from. And you can see most of those are your neighbors or are very close by. 
And when we take a look at that, when we, when we develop these kinds of market lists, where can a, a, a Warren County employee leave their driveway tomorrow and do nothing except drive in a different direction and be at a different workplace within 30, 45, or maybe perhaps an hour's drive. There's where all these other local governments come from. So the majority of your employees will not move to a different area of the state. You will have managers or department directors or technical folks who may entertain the thought of moving to a different part of the state Greater than 90% of your employees will not move just to go to work for another county or another local government. So what's important is where can they drive tomorrow in a relatively short period of time? There's where these local governments come from. So what, what does it look like when we start gathering all of that data from them? This is, this is our basic worksheet. This is for what? This is for Sheriff's Depot. And this is all of the information that each of those have. For that particular classification. Thank you, Paula. <coughs> so what we have here, again, back to that bell curve. This is the minimum salary. This is that midpoint or that highest point of that bell curve. Here's the maximum. This is the actual average salary for all deputies or police officers if it's a uh, municipal government. But we measured the range, how far is it from there to there? What is that measurement of that actual salary or average salary to that midpoint? This is Warren County's deputy. Warren County deputies are in a grade 19, a minimum of 30,395. Your average deputy earns 33,501. This is the average and the median of all of those local governments. You can see that you're over $5,000 or 18% below the minimum, which means that when any of these other local governments advertise for a, a, a deputy, they're av on average are advertising a starting salary of 35 cents. You're advertising 30,400. Your average salary for this particular classification is 33,5. Average salary for everybody else is almost 40,000. Again, you're about 18 percent behind the market. So we take a look at that and we say. Well, within your current structure, we need to move this particular classification from a grade 19 to a grade 22. At least get that minimum salary up to 35, something so you can be competitive. All right, but that's a three grade, that's a three grade movement. You have 5% differential between each grade. That's a 15% movement. If I'm a deputy and my salary is 30,395, I just got out of school, the sheriff hired me, brought me in at the minimum. My position gets moved to a grade 22. I'm going to get a $5,000 raise. So when I say when we came back on our initial recommendation, we cost $2 million, this is where a lot of that comes from. You have all of those employees who have salaries near that entry level. So if we begin moving these positions up to three, four, five, or more grades, that's a 5% movement every grade. So when we took a look at that, now I'm only using this as an example. Every one of your classifications has a worksheet like this. And when we worked through those worksheets, you actually had 52 employees who were in classifications that were right where they needed to be. In accordance with the market, they were in classifications that, that you were competitive with. You had 70 employees in classifications that need to go up one grade, 85 that needed to go up two grades. You can see the numbers. You had three employees that were in classifications that needed to go up six grades. So again, when I mentioned that $2 million number, 
If you implemented our initial recommendations, that's what it would have cost. And that's where you need to be to be competitive with all those other places. So we did have some general recommendations. Adopt a salary administration philosophy statement. And in your report, there are two examples of what that would look like. This is a statement that supports a mission and a vision statement. You may have a mission statement or a vision statement that says Warren County wishes to be the greatest county government in the state of North Carolina. We're going to deliver services at the highest level at the most cost-effective rate. That's a great mission statement, a great vision statement. But how do you do that? It's those 200 and some employees that you have that cause that to happen. This mission, this salary administration philosophy statement is the third leg of that mission vision statement. This is the, this is the third leg that balances it. This is saying to that mission or vision statement what the county wants to be this is the statement of how, how are we going to treat employees to do what they need to do. So all of this is in your packet. I won't spend a lot of time on this general recommendations. The very first thing you need to do is adopt our recommended pay plan where we are going to say to you, here's your classifications, here's our recommended pay grade. Because without the adoption of that, then none of these other recommendations can happen. So how do we get to where we have reasonable recommendations that are cost effective that begin the movement of where we think Warren County needs to be? Now you saw the number of classifications that needed to move up a lot of grades. What we're saying here is that we're going to limit that movement to two grades. No position can move more than two grades even though there were some that needed to go up six, five, four. The recommendation is going to contain a, a salary adjustment element that says every full-time regular employee will receive at least $2,500. It's also going to say that no single employee can receive an adjustment greater than $4,000 except where that employee would need a salary adjustment greater than $4,000 to just get moved up to the minimum of their new grade. You can't pay somebody less than the minimum of their grade. Employee salaries, and this is to address salary compression, employee salaries will be based on where their salary should be in accordance with the length of time they've been in their current position. We're recommending to the manager that those salary adjustments be implemented over the next three years. We're also recommending that in the second year and the third year that those members be increased 2% for the cost of living adjustment. When we say we're going to place employee salaries along the range in accordance with the, long, the length of time that they've been employed, that's what that chart looks like. If I'm a brand new employee, I just started in my position, my salary's going to be at the minimum. If I've been in my position 10 years, I'm going to be right there. So our focus is that every one of your employees who've been in their position 10 or more years will have a salary that will be at the midpoint of their range. Now from that first chart, you saw that there were a lot of employees who've been with you greater than 10 years. This is just that first initial step. Our focus is to get them to at least here. Just because I've been here 40 years right now doesn't mean my salary is going to go here. Our focus right now is just to get you to that midpoint, to that average salary, that market value of the position. So that's that formula that we used to look at 
Now, what does that look like? In the first year, that means 385,000 in salaries. To that, we need to add about 23% for FICA, retirement, 401k. That's going to be another 887, dollars $474,000 in the first year. And then you can see 484, 493 for years two and three. Now, to further refine that, that's assuming that the implementation takes place July 1st. What if we delay implementation until January 1st? Then those numbers get, especially for the first year, because that's the one that we're going to focus on now. That number gets reduced down to about 237,000. But it's actually going to be less than that because this is assuming full employment. This is assuming that all of your positions are filled. Uh, and if you're like every other county, you're not going to have every position filled all the time. So this, these numbers actually are assuming full employment. So the, the actual numbers are actually going to be a little lower than this. But a recommendation for the first year implementation, about 200, and actually it would probably be closer to 215, 220, probably. But that's if you delayed implementation until January 1st. Those numbers over the next three years will get you to about 1.5. So this is still recommending that you increase your salaries one and a half million dollars over the next three years. But if you're implementing all of our recommendations right now, that would be 2.3 million. So this is not getting you to where we think you should be. This is beginning you on that, those steps to get to where you need to be. And if you don't do the 2% and the 2%, then you're, you're, you're just, you're not even catching up. So, that, that, that was brief, I think. I apologize for the, the microphone, my, my voice. It's not as strong as it used to be, but the report that you have has more detailed information in it. Paula copied the PowerPoint, so that PowerPoint information is going to be available to you. And if, after you've reviewed the report and you've had additional discussions, if you would like for me to come back and meet with you and have further discussion, I'd be glad to do that. And be glad to answer any questions that you may have now. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Hill. I just wanted to address how commissioners got home first. Uh, Ms. Baker, do you have any questions for Mr. Hill? No, not at All right, Commissioner Powell. No, not at this time. discussions. Would we just discuss uh, different implementation options or different uh, implementation strategies? One of the things we looked at was what if we just focused on implementing certain departments the first year, another group of departments the second year, another group of departments the third year. From that one chart you did see that you had 50 employees whose positions were about where they needed to be. Now that does not mean that those 50 employees' actual salaries were where they needed to be. Health and DSS. In the chart, you can see that I put in some representative classifications in addition to the sheriff's deputy. I put in public 
Hale's nurse. I've been in social worker, income maintenance case worker. If you took a look at the positions of Hale's, DSS, and Sheila, and again, because those are the three largest departments, that's where, that's where the majority of the cost of implementation comes from. Not only were they probably the greatest deviation from market, the, the number of employees who were in those classifications just compounded or added to that cost. So to start at a particular point, that's very difficult to say. We could go back and look at the numbers again and say, if you were going to spend $237,000 the first year, where's the best place to put it? In my opinion, the best place to put it is overall. I think you need to move all of your employees, all of your positions along at the same rate. Instead of focusing on one group of employees or classifications now, a different group in the second year, a different group in the third year, because of course when you get to the third year, that first year now is three, three years behind market. So my recommendation is to, to move everybody along, particularly because we're moving everybody along at, at small steps. We're not getting to where you probably should be immediately. So to move some and not move others, I think, uh, is going to be an efficient way to implement, in our opinion, what needs to be implemented. That's all. Uh, Mr. Hunt. No. No question. Uh, all right. Um, I, I don't have any questions yet. I think it was a great presentation. I think um, very detailed and uh, really explains a lot. And I, I appreciate you being here as you come out. Well, again, the report has, a, has much more detailed information in it, and I probably have about two minutes left in my voice. Okay. <laughs> but again, I'll be glad to come back after you've had an opportunity to look at everything, uh, meet with you individually or as groups, and answer any questions that you may have, and go over the data and see if there's a different way that we can look at the, at the numbers. Go ahead, Mr. John. Sure. Thank you, Chair. I would just like to thank Mr. Hill for his work. We've uh, enjoyed getting to work with him over the past few months, and he has been able to help us to identify some other sort of operational issues that we can work on, and so I'm hoping that we'll be able to engage him further after we wrap this up. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, well, we're going to move right on into our budget discussion, which is item 3A, uh, 3A. And uh, what I'm going to ask is Mr. Jones to just give us a, a brief recap overview of his presentation at our last board meeting. And then from there, we'll just uh, ask that any commissioner has a specific uh, department or item that they want to discuss, that they'll bring that up and we'll address it in, in that fashion. Mr. Jones. Sure. Thank you, Chair. I just want to provide a brief overview like you mentioned. Uh, we were able to bring the proposed budget to you and, uh, last week, and the proposed budget for fiscal year 21 is $33,084,903, and that is a 1.2% uh, increase over our current budget with the adjustments that we have made uh, in this current fiscal year. We were challenged with putting together a budget for you because we are in this pandemic that um, has just been a quite interesting um, uh, event to have to deal with. I think it's been unprecedented is the word that many people are using. And we are trying to make sure that we are recommending to you a budget that we can um, stand behind, that you can stand behind, that we can monitor um, going forward. And so we paid special attention to making sure that we adjusted some of our revenues down to account for what we think the impact will be. And so you will see those recommendations in that budget proposal. We reduced our 
property tax projection, uh, sales tax projections, uh, motor vehicle tax projections, um, revenue for our health department as well. Um, and that all combined um, required us to use approximately $587,000 in our unassigned fund balance, and we we're also are recommending a two cent increase to our tax rate. Some of the projects that we are trying to focus on are those that the board has identified as priorities for us. And that includes making sure that uh, we were able to pay attention to funding for education. Uh, we also try to fund the broadband project and our next steps in broadband. And um, we wanted to make sure that we um, made sure that the county was continuing to, to make progress with regard to the budget. And again, the other item was what you just saw, we also tried to fund a start to implementing some of the recommendations from the compensation study, realizing that we cannot do that whole um, implementation in one bite, but we wanted to start down the road of over a few years trying to implement those recommendations. We have public safety uh, that we tried to address as well. Radio towers is part of our radio project that our fire departments will be implementing. And um, those are the major highlights that I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, we did have some inflationary increases in health insurance, which is what you can expect. But um, with that said, I will wrap that up. And uh, we are here if you all have any questions um, about what we've included in the proposed budget. All right, thank you, Mr. Jones. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the board, what I'm going to do now, uh, as stated before, I'm just going to open the floor up. Uh, if there are particular uh, department or uh, line items that you want to discuss, um, just ask to be recognized, and you know, we'll go from there. The floor is open. All right, Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hunt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there was one budget item I just wanted uh, clarification. It was under human resources. It's miscellaneous. And the request was 15000 and the re recommendation is 262121 Well, hopefully that's that uh, salary uh, yeah. study stuff. I would hope. Okay. Yeah, I saw that. I saw just, that. just a little bit of a jump. Uh, okay. But yes, that's in fact, that's what it is. Uh, Mr. Hill just mentioned that we could not, um, well, I knew we tried to make sure we could afford what we could. And so the recommendation in the proposed budget is that we fund that first year of the compensation study at six months, meaning we would start in January. And so that was the amount, and that's where it's placed. The appropriations for weed control, uh, having no problems with that, I think it's 116000 uh, If my memory serves me correct, I saw a report that they have almost a million dollars in their fund balance. And I'm just wondering, uh, are we obligated to keep supporting that project at the current rate? Well, we can check with them, Commissioner, but they made a point at our last meeting this spring um, before we got into pandemic mode of requesting, um, you know, they, it, sometimes they may go a year without using the funds because they can rely on their fund balance, but because they had to do treatment, they actually requested the funding that we have in the budget this year, and they also requested that we budget for next year. So they anticipate having to use those funds because they have use their fund balance over the last couple of years. But we can certainly have that conversation with them. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Ms. Bacon. No, I have to say that Ms. Jones did that for me, so I'm fine. Okay. Ms. Powell? I 
Um, well, this is turning out to be a very good uh, budget work session. Um, <laughs> there's not much um, request and conversation around it. Um, yeah, I don't have my book, but I have CD, so I actually have thumb drive, but that's okay too. But you know, from the last presentation, even though I can't like, pinpoint and go through which item it is, so there were certain things that um, <coughs> Mr. Jones had presented that I kind of like raised the eyebrow for me. Um, one was um, the extra person in um, 4-H, and I understand the request came because um, they're lowering the juvenile age from, well, they're increasing it from 16 to 18. But once upon a time, when we were doing youth services, one of the things that we wanted to do were bring in other resources under our umbrella, and that was um, different service providers. And I think we kind of shied away from that, and I think it's something that we need to look back into instead of trying to do everything in-house. So, you know, if we can just hold off potentially on that position until we actually um, can go back to JCPC and they do their next round of um, requests for proposals and things like that. I think that would probably be in our best interest because again, I don't want in County, our 4-H to be a, and even the Boys and Girls Club, just to be a, you know, one size fits all kind of deal. There were other service providers that were interested, but the way that we had it set up in the past just wasn't efficient for some of those providers, but I think it's a different climate now. Um, and I think that's definitely something that we should consider, or at least hold off, freeze that request for the time being. That would be my um, request. Um, and then also, I wanted some clarification. I spoke to Mr. Jones about it, but you know, I just want to bring it out to everybody. So there was the initial request for like the 10,000 or so, how much was it for the recreation? 20,000, right. Yeah. So, you know, we did the comprehensive study and everything, and everybody wants to do, you know, different programming and whatnot. So I definitely want us to get that underway, you know, with different um, members of the community, whoever is, you know, available, as well as I understand um, the middle line of gym, maybe coming under our umbrella, you know, at least under a contract basis, you know, but we want to bring all parties you know, to the table so that we can offer more services to the citizens of the county. So they do know that we're trying to expand some services. So that's just something that else I wanted to look into. Now, in regards to um, the compensation study, it's definitely needed, <coughs> but we've often heard, you know, the people who have been here the five years, the 10 years, it's great that we're moving everybody, let's say at 2%, you know, but when you have those people who have been there five years or so, when they're moving at that same 2% as somebody who came in last year and their salaries are so close, you know, I don't know if we're fixing anything. I think we do need to do something, but I still want us to look at, you know, what additional, or so what difference can we do with that? And I guess it's something we'll have to involve Mr. Gill on, but that's just something that I think we should look at, especially when you have those employees who've been here 10 years and they're like, I'm not even at my midpoint. You know what I'm saying? But that's just something, you know, that I would request we consider. Yeah, and um, I'll pick it back on what uh, Commissioner Pierce just said, especially when it comes to uh, the recreation, expanding recreation. I think that's a needed uh, uh, throughout the county that we proceed in that direction to offer those services to, to the um, citizens that are uh, basically, I want to say not able to, but it's, it's such a distance for them to travel to the, uh, the recreation complex and, and, and different other uh, aspects of the county that have recreation. I think that's important. So I, I really appreciate that aspect of addressing that, uh, that point. Um, I do have a question about uh, nonprofits this year. Where are we at with that this year as far as funding? So we have spent the $40,000. It's been awarded, and we can get you that report to show it. We just budgeted the same amount for it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that was my question. Right. Okay. So you just budgeted the same amount for $40,000. Okay. And when it comes to nonprofits, is there a way that we can generate the points scale, but can we do maybe a different? 
playing scale whereas a person hasn't applied before but we still see that need that they may get an extra one or two points or something like that versus if we have business or um, organization ABC and we funded them at 10,000 for the last five years, you know, maybe we can look at somebody else, not necessarily saying that we wouldn't fund organization ABC, but then we also start considering other organizations that will bring value to the county that we haven't funded at that level before. So that's a good point. Um, and I am taking notes, and so I can wait until you all have gotten all your comments down and then try to go back through them, but we will respond to, to these um, items. But that's a good suggestion. We have been looking for ways that we can sort of encourage people to use the nonprofit funding, and we do want to spread that, those resources are around the, the community so that we aren't in a position where it's the same group um, receiving funds <coughs> year, year over year. So, understood. Uh, Mr. Jones, I, I do want to go back to um, the, the comment about 4-H debt position there. Can you, can you explain why that re request was made? And sure, I'd like to take some time to go back and look through our notes and get with Ms. Smith and get you back a written response just to make sure I'm capturing it correctly. Okay. And, and uh, so we'll provide that to you uh, uh, this week. Okay. And what was that projecting start in salary for that position? Don't worry about it. Uh, I'll see if Ms. Bradford has that detail. And while they're looking for it, another thing that came to mind, so I know you know it's getting close to the end of the budget year and usually departments are looking at their budgets and saying, yeah, we got a couple of dollars and they start doing a little extra spending. It happens, I've seen it. Um, can we just freeze non-essential spending? Right, so we were on track and we did that as of April 15th. We stopped that just because we are expecting that we're going to receive less <laughs> revenue this year. So we've asked only if it's some sort of emergency uh, that we spend. Thank you, Kathy. I think it's the first or second one on the page. Sure. So that salary <coughs> we have is, we have an increase of $21,602. Um, I think the total impact will be about $34,000. And the reason I'm going to get you an update in writing is because I think this was not completely a new position, but um, increasing a position that's already part-time. So I'll make sure that I have that correct for you and get you the update. I think that, that was the situation there. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Uh, under the miscellaneous Another one that I just wanted clarification. What department? Uh, <coughs> it's just miscellaneous. Okay. Miscellaneous. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. Appropriation. And uh, the request for one line item was three hundred and fifty-five. I mean, three hundred and fifty dollars, and the recommendation was one hundred and seventy-five thousand. That, that that sounds like, um, oh, okay, Sharp, that is, is that, that's the funding that we have in place for a broadband. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Y'all to get real early to get something fast there, Commissioner. <laughs> we, we know that. We know that. <laughs> All right. I don't know what that is. <laughs> so, no, so, yeah, that was just, we moved over, I think, what was in there from last year. Oh, okay. And we decided that that was a good way to <clears throat> put the funds for broadband. Okay. Can, yeah. can I ask you a question with that? Can we add that as a particular line item as far as earmarking money specifically towards broadband? Can we do that? Sure. We just would have to work with finance to come up with the appropriate line item number. Oh, okay. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to see that. Yeah, I would, I would too. I would like to see that as a, uh, a line item. What department would you put that on? What would you guys stand on? But anyway, all right. And Mr. Jones, please uh, don't think I was 
question you all's uh, integrity, but uh, at my home, when I see miscellaneous, it's, I, I need to research it. So. <laughs> None, but, but good job. Yeah, no, no offense taken. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Okay. So thank you. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, y'all have any questions? I'm gonna wrap this thing up. Um, I think that what is our next meeting the, as far as budget is concerned? The 19th. Is <coughs> mistaken? I think it's the 19th. The 19th. Yes. Yeah. Five. Five p.m. The 19th, I'm sorry. Next week? Yes, next Tuesday. Okay. That's necessary, right? You know what? I have something else. So if you wouldn't, I found a young lady watching. If you didn't give us a report back from the schools as far as, you know, the capital, the conditions of the schools, maybe if we have any update on potentially maybe South Warren, um, just to put us in a note, because I know we didn't have our joint meeting that we had scheduled, or we're scheduled to have scheduled. Um, if we could just still get an update, and um, if she could just let us know if they're still on the table with the consolidation of in schools, or just any update. Sounds good. Thanks. Now, uh, I guess that request is, uh, is that in, in the fashion that potentially you know, in the Yeah, I want to know if because of the budget, because if they're doing, you know, capital projects and they're doing, you know, they're trying to update <coughs> Marion Ward again, are we really trying to do that when, you know, we've already gone through with the ADM schools and stuff like that? So it's just one of those things, like, are we spending money that we want to, you know, try to upfit or security for the schools when we really <coughs> may not be there? Much longer, you know. I'm just curious yeah. if that's something that we're going to do, or if that's really not in the plan. So I'm just curious to know. So if you could just let me know. Yeah. Um. I I, I truly agree, and, and I, I guess that the the recommendation by the county manager I think falls right into you know I think where we should be in regards to uh, school funding. Um. Maybe. We probably gonna adjust that because, like I said, if we're doing things that does not necessarily need to be done based upon what has occurred in the past, then we probably need to be adjusted some more. Okay, so we will we will um, have a discussion with schools and, and and see what they say, and then we will keep everybody informed about what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, just for this budget, but it could be certainly for upcoming budgets. You know, just so it's kind of on the radar. Yeah. So that we are aware. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, do you have anything else tonight? Miss Baker? No. Miss Powell? I think that is enough. <laughs> Commissioner Peters? No. <laughs> Ms. Jones, we really appreciate you and your staff and uh, putting this budget together for us. And um, like always, we encourage the commissioners, if they have a particular question, to reach out to you and one-on-one uh, -on -one and see how we can um, better remedy this thing and get it across the, the, uh, the finish line here. Um, <coughs> if there is nothing else to discuss, I will adjourn our meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. You're exactly right. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm ready to get about this. Okay. Uh, so who's doing what I think? I'm sorry. Th that would be me. Okay. It won't be long. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. I thought you were going to let me get away with it. I was. <laughs> <laughs> so, while we don't have the final results of our broadband RFP to bring to you just yet, I am going to give you a little update on our initiative since we did issue our competitive RFP in March. Um, or got those results in March. So the county, just to remind you of our timeline, the county formally released a request for proposals in our effort to bring new solutions to broadband availability here in Warren County. That RFP was released on January 7th and vendors submitted responses in early March. So a team of Warren County staff and community voices was um, assembled to review the submitted proposals in order to make a recommendation to you. 
And that review team consists of county administration, public safety representatives, and staff from planning and zoning, county IT, economic development, and Warren County Schools, as well as two community representatives. And the process, as you know, has been led by the consulting firm Mighty River, LLC. So in our RFP, we identified three sectors in need of new or improved service. That was our unserved areas, our higher density uh, population areas, servicing residents and businesses, and our own government facilities. We received two competitive responses from vendors in that RFP process. Since responses have been submitted, the review team has met, I think, four times, including interviews with those prospective vendors that submitted responses. Joe Ferdoso of Mighty River has been very helpful in leading that correspondence and facilitating those follow-up questions with those prospective vendors. So we've also been exploring options outside of those RFP responses as alternative options or supplementary options to the RFP response. So as you see in our proposed budget for fiscal year 21, we have included $175,000 for year one of the broadband initiative. This is on the low end of what we can expect to annually contribute in the first four to five years of implementation depending on the route that we go. So we also plan to pursue grants, whether it's ourself or through the provider, um, pursue grants as supplementary funding where appropriate and feasible. So we know that the public is, they're eager to see these new solutions in the marketplace. And I just wanna assure y'all and, and everyone in the county that our team is steadily working on an answer that is appropriate and within our scope of capability and that addresses the major needs that we know we have. But as we've said many times in the process, um, one of the most important things is to manage expectations. We wanna get this right, and getting it right takes time. So this will not be an overnight fix, and it won't even be a 100% fix for our county. I think that's really important for people to understand. I think it will get us a lot further, um, but we are getting much closer to implementing some of those strategies that we've been reviewing. So I hope we can bring those to y'all in the near future. Any questions? Well, uh, not necessarily a question, but I have a comment though. Uh, in, re in regards to uh, this year's budget, it, it's good to know that we are moving in a progression format that addresses uh, a holistic approach to our future in regards to what we are doing as far as funding. Um, broadband, you know, we're specifically earmarking money because during this COVID-19 pandemic here, we have seen and we know how in the rural community, how there is a greater impact when we don't have access to the internet. Uh, and very challenging. So we have to do our due diligence in order that if this happens ever again, that it rests on our shoulders to make sure that we start the process in order to ensure that our citizens do not fall behind the lines as far as having access to, uh, access to information. Going a step further, when it comes to this budget. We're really addressing our employees that during the COVID-19 still had to come to work, still had to provide the services, still had to do this, had to do that, all right? Not to mention, of course, with our school system, the, the disparities that they have faced when it comes to it. This also helps aid in that uh, growth. So with all that said, I'm just really excited to know that this year's budget addresses those issues specifically, not just in a, in a general fashion, but specifically the citizens can see that we are addressing these needed issues within our county. That's where they are. They can go and read and say, hey, it's there. That's what that money is for. And I, I like to say, again, I applaud you all putting this budget together because it really speaks to our needs and our growth of this county. If we want to be competitive throughout the state, the country, these are the things that we have to do, and I appreciate that. So, anything else?
Yeah. <laughs> oh, now he's ready for the All right. Um, all right. If there's uh, anything else, I will just bring this meeting to a close. I don't think there's any questions. Yeah, I think Ms. Baker says she's good. Ms. Baker, you, you good, right? Yes, I'm good. Okay. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I take it that we are going to utilize our meeting on the 19th based upon the conversation. Is that yes or a no? All right, Ms. Baker says yes. I bet so, Ms. Baker. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, we, we've got time, right? We've got time. If your questions um, get answered beforehand and we don't see the need for the 19th meeting, then we will definitely address it at that point. Is that, is that good enough for you, Mr. Jones? Sure. Yes. Commissioners, is that good enough for you all? All right. Sounds good. All right, go on there, Mr. Powell. You got anything else, Mr. Powell? No, no. Okay, all right, good deal. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, I hereby uh, declare that we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.